So, let us start lecture 31 and the course is corrosion failures and analysis and uh, we have been discussing pitting corrosion and mainly the conditions for pitting corrosion. We have discussed four conditions till now, one is pitting passivating metal, then chloride ion concentration and effect of chloride ion concentration, then we talked about stagnant situation and we talked about presence of oxidizers Fe plus 3 or Cu plus 2 ions that can lead to pitting. Uh, because pitting in case of Fe plus 3 it actually raises increases pitting because it actually uh, reacts or uh, gives a, a negative impression to the passivation. So, that is what uh, pitting starts. Now, in case of copper plus plus it actually gets deposited on the surface and that forms a small bid which actually becomes a strong cathode. So, locally cathodic reaction happens and around that area would have a pit formation. So, those are the situations where we can have pits. Now, we will discuss few more conditions and then we will talk about mechanism of pitting. Now, uh, cor course is corrosion failures and analysis lecture 31 topic pitting corrosion. Now, conditions let us just mention those previous condition uh, passivating metal, second is presence of chloride ion, third is stagnant situation. Fourth is presence of oxidizers Fe plus 3, copper plus 2, because those are strong oxidizers, because why? Because they can get reduced quite easily. Now, uh, the fifth one, let us look at uh, uh, from the point of macroscopic macroscopic and microscopic conditions favoring pitting so this is why you are talking about uh, conditions favoring pitting. Okay. Now, uh, if we look at macroscopic structure of metal, let us say I have a metal surface, two metal surface and uh, for your information you can make uh, iron let us say mild steel. Uh, 0.2 percent carbon steel that you can make a, a very shiny uh, and mirror like surface by doing metallographic polishing. What you do? We start with a, a let you take a sample, you cut it and then uh, you uh, grind it on a belt grinder first and then take it to different grades of uh, uh, emery papers or we say that uh, uh, polishing papers. So, those papers the lower the number higher is basically the uh, uh, particle size there and then as you go higher and higher number of that particular paper it makes the scratch much finer and finer. So, that is what we start with the belt grinder and then gradually we remove the scratch and then finally we go to uh, cloth polishing uh, belt or cloth polish cloth polisher and that in that cloth polisher we polish it in such a fashion that it becomes scratch free and then it becomes shiny and mirror like and that mirror like structure we expose it to HN to make it uh, edge structure to see the microstructure under optical microscope. Okay. So, that way we do metallographic sample preparation and there if we start with the belt, belt grinder and let us say it is a mirror like mirror like structure. Okay. So, in both the cases this case we have higher pitting possibility.
this case higher pitting possibility, this case it will be much less, much less pitting. The only reason is because that surface is rough, rough surface lead to pitting, smooth surface. Okay, so, let us put uh, surface smooth and rough less pitting. So, here interestingly uh, we are talking about uh, mic macroscopic uh, surface means the morphology or the texture remember this texture is not crystallographic texture this texture is how the surface appears. For example, you can feel some surface which is rough, feel some surface which is very smooth. That means it reads to it, it relates to roughness parameter. Okay. So, that rough surface has a much higher pitting tendency, smooth surface has got lower pitting tendency. So, this is on the macroscopic part. Now, coming to microscopic part. So, in the microscopic part we mean to say that if we can let us say 0.2 percent carbon steel, if we make a mirror like structure and then we etch it in nitrile solution. So, that means let us say 0.2 percent carbon steel, uh, we make a mirror like structure surface then etch in let us say 3 percent nitrile and if we look at optical microscope, microscope we will see a structure like this. So, these are alpha grain which is and here another condition is let us say annealed. That means, it is a very slowly cooled after going to austenitite or after austenitization, we cool it very slow. That means, in the furnace, we keep it and then put off the furnace with the cooling, slow cooling of the furnace, the sample also gets cooled. So, that sample we have prepared the optical, optical we, have, we have seen the optical microscope under my optical microscope and optical micrograph we see. We say that optical micrograph. Okay, so, there these are the ferrite grain or alpha grain. So, these are the grain boundary fine and since it is 0.2 percent carbon still there will be some amount of perlite. So, those perlites are present very small amount of uh, uh, lamellar structure of perlite can be visible. So, this is perlite. So, now this structure, so this is mac microscopic in nature, well, until unless we see it under optical microscope, we will not be able to see this structure. Even if you etch it, if you want to see with the naked eye, it is impossible to see the structure. So, uh, this is called uh, microstructure. Okay. So, the grain structure create a structure within this particular system and there are also there is also one more structure called crystal structure. The crystal structure is basically alpha grain if you consider it is BCC structure uh, body centered tetra, body, body centered cubic okay, uh, where carbon is uh, present in the tetrahedron position uh, uh, okay, so, uh, or, or, or octahedral position depending on uh, uh, the size of that particular uh, uh, voids. Now, uh, the carbon is actually uh, sitting in interstitial position rather I would better say this. And grain boundary is basically uh, two grain, the growing grains are actually merging at one point. So, that creates a grain boundary and perlite contains alpha lamella, lamellae and cementite lamellae. This is called cementite. So, these are the lamellar structures. So, this here again this is BCC, but this is complex 
crystal structure, it has a complex crystal structure. So, uh, the crystal structure is different, the microstructure is different. Microstructure, what we see, uh, this is the microstructure. Now, here, interesting part is when we have this structure, if we try to see the pitting possibility, pitting is more along the grain boundary. Along the grain boundary, pitting would be more. And also the grain body, there could be some pits, but those pits would be very few and they would lie close to that particular uh, uh, grain boundary region. Now, if it is uh, uh, if it is deformed, that case within the grain body, you can find lot of pits. If it is aged, if it if it is exposed to uh, if it, uh, exposed to uh, sodium chloride solution, right? So this now, why do you have lot of pits along the grain boundary? Because the grain boundary is the active region because it has a structure which is very active because it uh, uh, the reactivity to the uh, uh, to the agent or the chemicals would be very fast and interestingly that's what we would be able to see the grain boundary fast and then we see little bit of features of the grain body now we have explained that that within the grain body grain boundary there is a dip so if we see cross section of the grain boundary we'll see like this this is the grain boundary so then gun boundary if i try to look at through optical micro, micro, microscope the those lights are falling here lights are falling so there could be multiple reflection and then finally the light is coming to the eyepiece and that uh, since there is a multiple reflection along in the particular group that is formed along the grain boundary due to higher reactivity of that particular grain boundary to the chemical which one is used for the agent for etching that particular surface. So, that is what because lot of re internal reflection the light energy would reduce. So, that is what this portion would look like dark portion, but the flat section which is the uh, grain body the ferrite grain light is coming and then coming to the eyepiece. Okay. So, then you could see that it becomes very shiny. So, that is what grain body looks a uh, uh, bright color, but grain boundary looks dark color. So, this is the reason why initially everything was flat, everything was flat, initially everything was flat because of the reactivity of the grain boundary it has it has formed a valley there and that creates a situation which allows that grain boundary to get visible to be to uh, grain boundary to be visible. Okay. So, now whether this is experimentally experimentally possible let us see that so i have some picture okay so let me show those pictures if we see this particular set of microstructures now these are all acm microstructures remember and uh, uh, here if you see this is uh, a zero point this is the steel is 0.17 percent carbon steel with little bit of manganese and silicon and if you anybody wants to check those particular figures, they can refer to this particular uh, paper. So, this is uh, also a work done at IIT Kanpur. Now, what has been done here that particular steel was deformed and recrystallized. Now, in the beginning the asresive structure had this particular microstructure. So, there if we carefully see uh, uh, these are the uh, these are the basically perlite colonies you cannot say perlite uh, uh, phase because it has two uh, constituents ferrite and cementite so that's what we call it called a perlite colony so these are the perlite colonies and those white portions are covered by a boundary so these are the grain boundary these are the grain boundary these are the grain boundary fine and this is the grain body this is ferrite alpha grain. Okay. So, this microstructure is as received uh, uh, 0.17 percent carbon. So, this is little rolled and uh, 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 air cooled. Okay. So, that is the microstructure we get. Now, in this case the grain size was one can make out the grain size by looking at this particular micron bar. Uh, so, it is around close to 30 
4 to uh, 40 micrometer grain size. Okay. Now, that particular st steel was deformed and after deformation we uh, this particular deformed steel was recrystallized due to recrystallization at some specific temperature and time uh, very fine microstructure was created. So, that microstructure so in this, this particular microstructure uh, this microstructure so this is the microstructure this microstructure has a grain size 4 around 4 micrometer. Okay. If you look at uh, this particular uh, micron bar you could see that the 4 micrometer. Now, after that it was uh, recrystallized for a longer duration at a higher temperature then we created another structure which is having grain size around 18 micrometer. Okay. So, if you see the grain size is much smaller. So, these are the grain size okay. so these are the grain which is around close to 18 micrometer average grain size is 18 micrometer. Now, after that we also created some condition we have used we have created a bimodal structure. where fine grain and coarse grain microstructure is created. Okay. So, now if you can see that uh, some grains are quite large and some grains are very small. Okay. Uh, for example, these are the small grains, these are the small grains and one grain is very large. Okay. So, like that large grain and small grain that particular microstructure has been created. Now, this particular steel was exposed to 3.5 percent NaCl solution okay. and once it is exposed to 3.5 percent NaCl solution we could see that the surface contains pits. So, these are the pits. Now, this is the steel corresponding to as received one which is having grain size around 34 micrometer. Now, as the grain size decreases due to recrystallization which is this one. So, this one is 4 micrometer grain size. So, their pits number of pits have gone up. So, these are the pits and you see the number of pits if you compare between these two uh, the finer grains have got much higher pit. Now, once we increase the uh, grain size to 18 micrometer we see the number of pits have reduced compared to this, but it is still larger if we compare this two and if you compare this two, this is in between the its grain size is in between uh, this two, one is 34, one is 4 micrometer and here it is 18 micrometer which is let us say 18 micrometer. Okay. So, now number of pits have reduced compared to this one which is 4 micrometer, but it is number of pits is, is more in this case compared to this. So, now uh, uh, the interesting part is you could see there is a kind of relation that larger the grain size lower is the number of pits and smaller the grain size higher the number of larger number would be the pits. And similarly, if we contain bimodal structure, so this is basically the bimodal structure. Okay. So, their number of pits are also uh, there, but those pits are uh, some pits are much larger than these two cases. So, this case and this case if you compare this case some pits have gone very large. Okay. But now that means if we reduce the grain size the number of grain boundaries or the amount of grain boundary volume fraction of grain boundary will go up. Since the grain boundary is the active zone so the possibility of pitting would go up. So, that is what it exactly happened. Now, we have to also see whether those pits because here it is not clear where those pits have formed in order to do that this particular steel after formation of pit we remove the top layer and after removing the top layer we etched it. And once we etched it we could see that the some of the pits which have gone little deeper into the material those left their impression on that particular microstructure. Okay. So, this is that microstructure. So, let me show to the uh, zoom version of that microstructure this is the zoom version of that microstructure. So, this is 0.17 percent carbon weight percent of course, and this is aged in 3 percent nitre. And before that it was corroded in 3.5 percent NaCl. Please go to that particular paper and you can see all the conditions over there. Now, after etching 
of that corroded surface after carefully removing the top uh, corroded surface, we could see the grains again. So, these are the grains. these are the grains is not it. So, and perlite is also visible. So, these are the perlites, these are the perlites. So, these are the perlites. Now, interesting part is we could also see pits. So, these are the pits. This is a big pit, this is a small uh, another pit, this is another pit and uh, there could be pit like this small pit. So, the pit has also gone inside the perlite colony and this pit has are formed just between the boundary and boundary between ferrite grain and perlite colony. So, there it has formed. Now, interesting part is this pit if you see this pit is also uh, there. Now, interesting observation if I consider this pit this is the grain boundary you see this is the grain boundary and the pit is actually going and if we draw those particular grain boundary. So, it actually on the grain boundary. Similarly, here if you see this one, this is the grain boundary and the pit is forming on the grain boundary. Similarly, if we see this one, so this is the grain boundary between or the interface between ferrite grain and uh, uh, perlite colony is a there's a there's a there's a pit. Now, if we see another this is the grain boundary and the pit is exactly on top of grain boundary. Now, mostly most of the pits are actually happening on the grain boundary. There are some pits which are actually forming within the grain. So, this is also on the grain boundary. So, the grain boundary you can plot. So, this is the grain boundary, this is another grain boundary. So, this has formed on the grain boundary. Now, some pits for example, if I look at this pit, this pit has formed within the grain body but interestingly it is not at the center, this is the center of the grain. So, this has formed close to the grain boundary. So, this is the grain boundary and this is the perlite uh, ferrite uh, uh, colony interface, this has formed close to that particular boundary. Even if you consider this one, this is this is the grain boundary, this is the grain boundary, but it has formed close to that. So, that means the grain boundary regions are susceptible for pitting. Okay. One is and that is what if we increase the number of grain boundary or the amount of grain boundary, you would definitely increase the pitting possibilities along the grain boundary or number of pits will also go up. Similar thing has happened here. 34 micron to 4 micrometer number of pits have gone up. 4 micrometer to 18 micrometer the number of pit has reduced, reduced to extent. So, that is what is the impression of grain boundary on the pitting possibility. So, coming back to our page, so that means the grain boundary the microstructure plays a big part in giving you uh, pits and the grain boundary is the one of the susceptible areas for pit. So, now we can say that susceptibility goes up for pt. So, one small study we have done and then that clearly indicates that why it happens. Now, microscopic change in the metal one is definitely microsco microscopic features. Now, microscopically there is one more involved thing which can involve there that is microscopic variation of composition. See one is microscopic variation of micro, uh, micro, microstructure microstructure variation another one is microscopic variation of composition. The microscopic variation we have talked about grain boundary is not it. There could be variations like which is a combined effect with composition and uh, microstructure variations. For example, let us say if it particular structure is strained, strained, 
extreme matrix. Okay. So, uh, if we recall one particular situation where we talked about knife line attack. which happens in the stabilized steel which is let us say 3 to 1 or 3 4 7. So, this kind of stainless steel one can have knife line intergranular corrosion. So, that time what we observed that uh, 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 that steel after doing af we have to do solutionization treatment and that solutionization treatment we do it at around close to uh, uh, around uh, 1200 degrees Celsius uh, and there uh, uh, what happens everything goes into solution all those uh, uh, niobium carbide or titanium carbide they also dissolve and chromium carbide also dissolve and then it becomes homogenized uh, microstructure homogenized structure okay, composition wise. So, then that steel would have a higher uh, resistance to knife line attack or grain boundary attack, but thing is if that particular steel is deformed and then taken to again to uh, uh, around 800 uh, 500 to 800 degrees Celsius after doing solutionization treatment homogenization treatment the entire steel becomes susceptible to intergranular corrosion and that particular steel everywhere one can have pitting. So, that means uh, uh, strain matrix which is also creating a kind of microstructural variation in the steel and that strain one we have to relieve the strain in order to avoid uh, stress related issues. So, that during that stress relief operation if we take it to around 500 to 800 degrees Celsius since there are no titanium carbide or chromium carbide it is absolutely fine, but once we take it to there because of the stress relief operation entire steel we have chromium carbide because the niobium carbide or titanium carbide cannot form for the formation of niobium carbide or titanium carbide one has to take it to around 1000 degrees Celsius. Since it is not taken there only chromium carbide comes out and that creates a situation that that steel would be very susceptible to intergranular corrosion as well as pitting corrosion. So, that means the strain matrix is also a reason for pitting corrosion, but if I talk about composition now composition creates huge issue. We talk about homogeneous inhomogeneous composition inhomogeneity. Now, what happens for example, if we have a stainless steel 18 8 18 8 stainless steel this is the grain boundary because of chromium carbide precipitation after sensitization fine this can happen during welding in that weld uh, decay zone. So, those zone we have the surrounding areas along the grain boundary we have a situation like sensitization or chromium depleted zone and we know around 12 percent weight percent chromium is needed for giving stainless steel property stainless property because the chromium up beyond 12 percent it actually passivates quickly forming chromium oxide uh, passive layer and that leads to passivation fine. So, since the chromium depleted zone that forms due to the chromium carbide precipitation along the grain boundary that chromium depleted zone would be susceptible to pitting. So, this zone would be pitting susceptible. So, that means it is a compositional inhomogeneity leading to pitting. So, the compositional inhomogeneity can lead to a pitting in several such examples are there. For example, in case of 5083 alloy which is uh, aluminum magnesium alloy. So, there also this compositional inhomogeneation because of the beta phase formation precipitation one can have compositional inhomogeneity along the grain boundary and then those precipitates those are actually active precipitates those dissolve and then create pits. So, it is a highly pit prone uh, uh, pit prone uh, metal or uh, pit prone aluminum alloy okay, because of that beta phase uh, precipitation along the grain boundary. So, compositional homogeneity can also happen in case of stainless steel. For example, uh, if we have sulfur in it, if we have manganese in it, the manganese sulfur 
can combine and form MNS and MNS can also combine little bit of chromium. So, then that uh, inclusion that happens, those inclusions are active inclusions. Those inclusions can dissolve and leave a pit over there on the on the on the on the on the on the microstructure on, on the on the surface of the particular metal. So, the composition inhomogeneity can also lead to serious pitting in many of the uh, circumstances. Whether it is a passivating metal or a non passivating metal does not matter, those composition inhomogeneity can create problem regarding pitting. Fine. So, composition inhomogeneity in the metal, there could be composition and inhomogeneity in the solution. For example, chromium content can be little high at one location, sorry, not chromium content, chloride content could be high at one location, chloride content could be low at one location of that same metal surface. Fine. So, the where the chloride content is little high that portion would be susceptible to pitting. So, those kind of stuff that composition inhomogeneity on metal in the metal or alloy or in electrolyte, electrolyte constituents. So, those can lead to pitting. pitting due to heterogeneous heterogeneous composition in metal or alloy not metal i would say it is it, it should be in alloy in alloy or in electrolyte we can have pitting because of the inhomogeneous composition across the surface it can be provided it can be possible in the alloy surface or it can be possible in the solution. So, those are the situations can lead to pitting. So, these are in general, these are the kind of conditions can that can lead to pitting. So, let us stop here on the condition part. Now, next lecture we will talk about mechanism part and then some of the protection routes what we can have uh, to prevent pitting. So, let me stop here. Thank you.